Hello. It's great to be here this morning with you to uh, be singing together and lifting voices of praise to our God, to be hearing about things that he's doing, not just in our community, but in other parts of the world. Uh, Today we've had the opportunity to hear from a missionary that our church supports. Uh, By now, if you didn't know him, uh, you got some introduction there. To make this connection more dear, uh, they attended our church before, which Wendell had said, so it's great to have you guys here. It's wonderful to see you and connect with you and to see you guys at grad. Uh, They're precious to many people who are here and who aren't here this morning with us. When I was praying and thinking about what to speak about today, it, it dawned on me that having the Garrison family speak to us made it a great time to speak about the mission and purpose that God has given Christians in this world. Our message today is going to be shorter than usual, uh, allowing us plenty of time to fellowship together downstairs and to visit with the garrisons and each other. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 13 to 15. Romans chapter 10, 13 to 15. And if you're physically able, I ask that you would stand with me this morning as we reverence the public reading of God's word. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning, for this opportunity we have not to get distracted by the world, but to cast our cares upon you, to look at your glorious face, Lord, to behold who you are and just to worship you, to praise you, to hear your word proclaimed. What an amazing opportunity to reset from the week behind and to set our focus anew for this week ahead, to recharge and to refresh in you and to meditate on you to have our minds renewed by you. Lord, work in our hearts this morning through your word and by the power of your spirit working in us that we would know you more and love you more. And Lord, this morning, make us people of beautiful feet and show us what that means. Thank you for your word and for this time. Amen. You may be seated. This is one of those passages of scripture that gets brought up a lot. It's usually a proof text or something to mention while you're speaking about something else. Often this text is used when speaking about the importance of preaching from a pulpit. And certainly that's a valid thing, and we'll look at that a little bit today, but there's something in particular that we need to see, and Paul breaks it down clearly for us in this text. Everyone who calls. I started with verse 13 because it's important, and I believe it sets the stage for the rest of our text today. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What an amazing statement. The word that Paul uses for saved means heal, rescue, preserve, save. And certainly every person on this earth is in need of healing, rescuing, preserving, and overall saving. Sometimes in the church, we can forget how desperately we need a God to save us. And how greatly we need him to continue to heal, rescue, and preserve us throughout our lives on this earth. Until we experience the fullness of his salvation. We can forget just how hopeless we are without Christ. We can take so much comfort and confidence in God saving us that we forget what it is he saved us from. While there are others in this world, likely in this building today, who are not saved, there's not yet been a realization of their great need of salvation. And maybe that's you. The truth is that every person on this earth is in need of a Savior. The Bible tells us that we are born with a sin nature and that our sin separates us 
from a holy God. Not only that, but we see that the penalty of sin is death, not just physical death, but spiritual death, eternal death. And more than that, we see that God is the judge of the world and that every day, every person, one day every person will stand before him and give an account for their lives. You know, there's many ideas and beliefs out there on how to prepare for that judgment day. Some teach and believe that the good deeds in your life have to outweigh the bad. It's on a scale. Some teach and believe that you must complete certain tasks, journeys, and works. Some teach and believe that you must continually be cleansed by a priest and repeat certain phrases over and over again. And some teach and believe that after you die, people can pray for you and change your outcome. Some teach and believe that you must have enough money when you die to pay for admission into heaven. And there are many more beliefs and teachings out there, including just hoping for the best. But the Bible tells us that all of this is foolishness. There's nothing that you can do to have a favorable outcome when you stand before the judge of the universe. If I were to ask you this morning, what would allow you to spend eternity in heaven with God? Any answer that started with I would already be incorrect. I believed, I went, I know, I attended, I got baptized. The Bible tells us that the only way that we can be saved is through the person and the work of Jesus the Christ. We need to be rescued. We need to be redeemed. But it's not by anything that we can earn or do. We're rescued, redeemed, and saved because Jesus died to pay our debt and to secure our salvation. He did it. And that's where our answer starts. Jesus said I could come. Jesus saved me. The only effort that we actually see described on our part is to call upon him. And as we look through scripture, we see that we're not even capable of doing that on our own. He needs to work in us to enable us even to call out to him. When Paul says call on or call upon in our text, the word that he uses means call upon on my behalf. It's personal. Call upon the name of the Lord and specifically to invoke, adore, or worship the Lord. You're calling on the authority of that name. You're calling for the help of that name. You're calling to worship and adore that name, that person, the Lord, our Christ. Verses 9 and 10, so just before our text, say, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So if your hope is outside of that this morning, it is misplaced. Test yourself, examine yourself to make sure that your salvation is secure. It doesn't matter if you raised a hand and walked down an aisle, if a pastor told you, good job, you're in. It doesn't matter if your parents wrote in your Bible, saved on this day. Are you truly saved? Are you trusting in Christ alone? And are you calling out to him? Paul says to call out to God, to worship and adore Him, to call out to Him in total and utter dependence, to call out to Him to save you. Paul says that everyone who does that will be saved. The ESV uses the word everyone. Other translations say whoever or whosoever. But the word that Paul uses, it's a favorite word for Paul, and it means all, the whole, every kind of, all, the whole, every kind of. And that's why many translations say everyone. So let's be clear here because Paul was being clear. There isn't anyone who's beyond the salvation of God. Maybe you needed to hear that this morning. Perhaps you just needed to be reminded of that today. 
It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've seen. It doesn't matter what's been done to you. If you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. If you're part of an all, a whole of humanity and every kind of person, then this verse is talking about you. And you may say, Pastor, you don't understand. You don't know the kind of horrible things that I've done, and you don't know what I've seen. Or you may say, Pastor, I believe that God is good and loving, but I know that I'm worthless. You don't understand the kind of things that I've been through. You don't know my shame. And whether you believe these kinds of things or anything else that may be said, listen to my words today. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Think about these words. Remember them. It's after Paul speaks about salvation being available to everyone that he starts going through a a bit of a logical trail of questions regarding people being saved, regarding people calling out. And so let's take a look at the things that he says. You won't call on someone you don't believe in. After Paul's beautiful address regarding the freedom of salvation for all who call upon Christ, he argues that people won't call on someone they don't believe in. Surely this doesn't require much explanation. If we don't believe that Jesus exists and that he is the Savior, we're not going to worship and adore him. And we certainly won't call out to him in dependence. If we don't believe that we need to be saved and that he is the Savior, we're not going to call out to him to save us. And Paul continues, it's hard to believe in someone you've never heard of. It's hard to believe in someone you've never heard of. This point seems obvious as well. But for me, when I read this, the issue is application. Paul says, how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? This question should break our hearts. In a time like this, a time where the internet makes information so readily available, too readily available, A time where travel throughout the world is accessible and relatively affordable. A time where the Bible is the most printed and sold book in the world with over 5 billion known copies distributed, and that doesn't include all of the online ones to reach closed countries. In a time like this, there are still people who have never heard about Jesus. They've never heard about their need of a Savior or the fact that there is a Savior who died for them. And on top of the many who have not yet heard, there are many who have heard misinformation, lies, and slander. They know a fake picture or a false Christ. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because they can't believe in the Jesus they never hear about. And because of that, they'll never call out to Him for rescue and salvation. Remember, this isn't just some hypothetical concept that we're talking about. These are real people. These are people in our community, in the grocery store, serving us in emergency services, parents of our children's friends, people in our church, in your family, in your home. people who are going to spend eternity suffering in hell. How can we think about that and not weep over the fact that people have not heard about our glorious Savior? Many years ago in a sermon uh, by David Wilkerson, A Call to Anguish, he's talking about how indifferent we become as Christians particularly to salvation and spreading the gospel. And there's one line where he says, you'll sit and watch TV while your family go to hell. And what about the world beyond our doors? And Paul takes his thought to another step. You can't hear if there's no one speaking. 
Paul asks, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? Another great question. The word that Paul uses here for preaching is referring to the proclamation of the gospel and the things relating to it. Paul says, hey, if there isn't anyone out there preaching the gospel, then no one's going to hear about Jesus. And if no one hears about the salvation of Christ, then no one will believe in him and call out to him for their salvation. Paul's question here is to draw attention to the importance of people proclaiming the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Surely if God has done such an amazing work in our lives and rescued us from such a horrible fate and given us the abundance of eternal life, then we should be eager and excited to tell everyone about what God has done for us and the salvation he has made available to them. But we live in a time where you will find much more excitement over essential oils than Christ. And there's a greater problem or a continued problem, and Paul addresses that next. No one will speak if they aren't sent. Paul asks, and how are they to preach? unless they are sent. What I love about this question is that Paul doesn't just put the emphasis and the responsibility on the person who needs to preach the gospel, but also on those who need to send. And again, Paul isn't throwing out some hypothetical thoughts or some questions without answers. He poses these questions to challenge us and to cause us to think. Paul asks how people will proclaim the gospel if they aren't sent because he knows that God has established a sending. And this happens primarily in two ways. Firstly, I want to highlight that the church has a responsibility to send. As a local body of believers on mission together, we support and send one another out to proclaim the gospel. We proclaim the gospel when we worship here together. We proclaim the gospel in our community and we strive to proclaim the gospel throughout the world. And this is all because of our commission from God. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Mark 16, 15 says, He said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. This is the duty and the pleasure of Christians to proclaim the goodness and the salvation of our God. You know, it's interesting to me that if we had the opportunity to represent the Queen of England or our favorite celebrity in some major way, the vast majority of us wouldn't hesitate at the chance. Imagine if a celebrity that you follow contacted you. Now, for some of you, that would be incredible enough. But imagine if they gave you access to all their money, all their social media accounts, got you to do their interviews for them, and gave you the authority and the power to go out and speak on their behalf as their representative to the world. And they would provide for all of your needs. And then more. Now take that idea to an incredible extent. Beyond all of that, your character would continually develop. You would have access to peace and joy beyond understanding, and you would be given help and strength for every trial you face. If these ideas are running through your mind, and I hope that they are, then you're just beginning to catch a glimpse of how beautiful it is that we are sent. This isn't a situation where a celebrity makes us their messenger. It's so much greater. Quite frankly, it's beyond belief. I know who Jared is. I'm not the guy I would pick to represent the God of the universe. Maybe you feel the same. 
That's part of the beauty. God looked and said, I choose you. I want you, my precious son, my precious daughter, to go out into this world, to show them who I am, to tell them about me. It's amazing. What a great honor that the Lord of this universe would commission us as his envoys, his messengers, to proclaim his glory and his salvation to the world, all while representing him. And so my question this morning is, what are you going to do with that great honor and privilege? What are you going to do with that great honor and privilege? beautiful feet. I told my wife that I'd plan on doing some kind of an introductory story to this message, and I scrapped it, and uh, I guess here it comes. Um, when I think about beautiful feet, uh, I do not picture my feet. They have seen some uh, miles and uh, got pretty scarred up and ripped up, and as I was preparing this message this week, for those of you who don't know, we just recently moved into a new home. For those of you who don't know, I have a pretty sizable uh, knife and sword collection. Right now, those are laid out all over my office floor because I haven't figured out what I'm doing with them. And as I was walking into my office this week to do something, uh, I wasn't paying attention. I got distracted, and I kicked into a blade. Uh, so my foot also is pretty cut up at the moment, <laughs> and it hurts to walk. So when I think of beautiful feet, I do not picture my own feet, and maybe that's the same for you. Good thing that's not quite what we're talking about. So you may have noticed what I named this message. We need beautiful feet. But just like there's hope for me, there's hope for you. This title is not clickbait. It's serious, and it's true. After Paul asks all of these questions, he makes a statement, a statement with an exclamation point. He says, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And I can just picture Paul standing up sitting. They got to sit to teach. I keep threatening it. One day, we're going to make it happen, and all of you are going to stand, and I'm going to sit. I can picture Paul sitting there and asking these questions, one after the next. And then just joyfully, powerfully exclaiming how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And this is related to multiple verses in the Old Testament, but typically we say it's Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The Israelites viewed a messenger bringing good news as a beautiful thing. Particularly when the Israelites were in captivity, a messenger bringing good news of freedom and salvation would be incredible. And just to be clear, a messenger running through the desert and mountains would certainly have some pretty nasty-looking feet physically. They would be filthy, likely cut, and scarred. But Isaiah and Paul are referring to how wonderful and life-giving it would be to see a messenger running to deliver news of happiness, news of salvation, news of an all-powerful God who reigns. Again, this is our commission from God to go out into all the world and to proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Our God has called us to have beautiful feet. Acts 13, 47 says, For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And Acts 1, 8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. An interesting little tidbit on that verse, when he says, you will be my witnesses, he's not saying like, this is something that could happen and go out. It's actually saying that you are filled. That's your identity. You become witness. You are witness. 
What an amazing thing that becomes part of our identity in Christ. We are witness. We are witnesses. Earlier, I asked, what are you going to do with that great honor and privilege? And now I ask you, what do your feet look like? Do you have the beautiful feet of a faithful messenger? Dear people, we've been given the greatest honor that could ever be bestowed upon us. It's weighty and difficult, but it is glorious. Perhaps you don't know how to share the gospel. If that's the case, I would love to talk to you about that. Maybe you're shy or scared to proclaim the gospel to your family or in your local community. I have good news for you. Isaiah 41, 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And perhaps you aren't able to go overseas for whatever number of reasons. Well, you still have an obligation to join in the proclamation of God's salvation throughout the earth, to the ends of the earth, or to the whole creation. And whether or not we go overseas proclaiming the gospel or we travel throughout this world ourselves, we all have this duty to fulfill the commission that God has given us. We can do this through faithfully praying for and financially giving to those with beautiful feet who are going to the mountains, the valleys, the deserts, the jungles, or anywhere else to proclaim the rescuing and salvation found in Christ. Now let me be clear, proclaiming the gospel doesn't mean you need to stand at a pulpit to preach. Only some are called to do that. It doesn't mean that you have to stop every person on the street and hand them a gospel tract or ask them difficult questions about their life and future. This doesn't mean that you have to abandon all that you know and head into uncharted jungles. What it means is that you will endeavor to share the wonderful news of a saving and redeeming God to the lost and the dying world around you. This might mean inviting someone out to coffee to tell them your testimony, asking a friend or a family member what they think will happen to them when they die, inviting your child's friend over to participate in family worship or a devotional, showing someone your love for them and then telling them of a much greater love or so many other things. We are surrounded all the time with opportunities to share the good news of a saving God. We just need to pay attention and be willing to speak. This is our honor and this is our privilege. Christians, you have a commission. God has called you and commissioned you and as your pastor, I am calling you and commissioning you. Go out. Spread the good news of the glory of God. Proclaim his salvation to a lost and dying world. And if you need help with that, I'd love to talk to you. How will you respond to your call? Will you respond the way Isaiah did? Isaiah 6, 8 says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. Let us all be faithful to joyfully and eagerly proclaim the goodness of our God and all the great works he has done for us. Let us be a people here today who say, here am I, send me. Houston Baptist Church, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent. Let us all be found as people of beautiful feet who preach the good news of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this chance to look into your word, this chance for your spirit to bring conviction to our hearts. 
And Lord, if there's anyone in here feeling that today, and I hope each one of us is, Lord, work in us. Show us what it really means to be your ambassadors to this world. Show us what it means to live heaven-minded. Show us what it means that the majority of this world is going to turn away from you. And that we're all going to stand before you as our judge. Lord, give us a burden for the lost around us, for the lost throughout this world, for those in different parts of this world who have never heard your name, who have never heard the hope of the good news. Burden us for them, Lord. Don't let our hearts be burdened with the trivial and mundane things of our blessed and and spoiled lives. Lord, call us to anguish and then fill us with your peace and your hope and your strength. Let us move forward from conviction to boldness, from conviction to hope and to new life and to joy because you are the one who does the work in us. You are the one who prepares hearts for your words to grab hold. You go before us and behind us and you surround us. Lord, you fill us. And God, you give us new identities in you and part of that identity is to be witness. Let us live in this reality. And Lord, for anyone who doesn't know you today, who's hearing these words, this message, convict them, show them their great need for a Savior, and Lord, reveal yourself to them as a loving and saving God who's done all that's required for them, that there's nothing more that they can add, that there's nothing they can do but call out to you. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation, for your goodness, and for your faithfulness to us, your people. Be with us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Before the guys come up to lead us,